Hello and welcome to this video on couples, the domestic division of labour and the impact of paid work. As we kick off, it's useful to have working definitions of the difference between families and households. So when we refer to a household, we're talking about a person living alone or a group of people living together, but they may not necessarily be related. So, for example, we could have a group of friends who are perhaps living together to save money on rent. Um, that would be a household. Or you could have a group of university students living together in halls, and that would be a household. But those people may not necessarily be related. Whereas a family is actually much more difficult to define. I mean, generally speaking, we often think of the family as the traditional nuclear family. Mum, dad, married with kids. There's a whole set of assumptions there with regards to how male and female roles should operate, how they should relate to each other. Also, there's kind of a heteronormative expectation there. So perhaps we need to broaden that out ever so slightly. And some sociologists argue that actually whoever so sees themselves as a family should be able to define themselves as a family. And we should perhaps think of families in that light. So if a group of people are living together, say, I don't know, a boyfriend, girlfriend, and perhaps um, the girlfriend has a child from a previous relationship and the boyfriend is acting as a father figure, we could argue that perhaps that is a family. Or perhaps if we had a brother and sister living together and then one of those two had a partner who moved in also and they wanted to consider themselves a family, they would be more than welcome to do so according to more contemporary postmodernist sociologists. We now need to consider couples and the domestic division of labour. And again, we are going to make, be making the assumption that we are talking about heterosexual couples for the most part. In the 19th century, the Victorian family was very patriarchal. And that's to say it was very male dominated. Women themselves were actually considered property. So upon marriage, it would be the father of the bride who would hand his daughter over to her new husband. And that would be the handing over formally of that woman as property. So they were literally property at that time. Upon marrying a woman's property became her husband. So if she owned anything, or if perhaps she was being married and she had received some form of inheritance, that inheritance would then become her husband's inheritance. So it was again, the formal handing over of property. Access to divorce was very much unequal. So generally speaking, it was only men who could access divorce. And you know, divorce was very rare at this point in time anyway, but it was only men who had access to it. And usually only in unusual circumstances. So things like um, if the wife had been uh, adulterous, had uh, been in a relationship with someone else, perhaps that would be grounds for divorce. The domestic division of labour refers to the roles that men and women play in relation to housework, childcare and paid work. So when we are talking about a division of labour, we're talking about splitting up tasks or jobs or roles. And in a traditional couple, you're going to have certain roles for men, certain roles for women, certain roles for husbands, certain roles for wives. And those are changing, as we'll come to see, but they are rooted in a very traditional and conservative set of views. Sociologists are interested in whether men and women share domestic tasks equally, um, whether they are sharing these more equally as time goes on, or whether perhaps we are still perhaps very much chained to traditional ideas about who does what around the home. It's important now to understand the difference between two very useful sociological concepts, namely the instrumental role and the expressive role. So traditionally, men have undertaken the instrumental role, whilst women have undertaken the expressive role. The instrumental role is essentially the role of the breadwinner, i.e. going out, working, earning money, getting paid and bringing that money home to pay for all of the family's needs, for the food, for the bills, for the house, for the mortgage, whatever, that's traditionally been seen as the male role. Whereas for women, for wives, they've often taken on the expressive role, which is staying at home, not working uh, in terms of paid work, and instead doing the housework, cooking and cleaning, whilst also rearing the children, doing the childcare. Talcott Parsons, a functional sociologist, argues that this division of labour between spouses is rooted in biology, that actually men and women are fundamentally different in terms of their biology, and that as a result, um, this is why we see them undertake different roles. So men being more physically fit or physically stronger, they are suited for 
historically working in the fields to earn money, but perhaps today it would be more working in a factory or simply engaging in more arduous manual tasks, hence why they should be the breadwinners. Whereas wives or women are suited to, first and foremost, having children. And by the nature of having children, they're probably likely to have some form of maternal instinct, or so Parsons would believe. And so they are the best to bring up the children. Um, because they have a sort of care and nurturing aspect to them, women should also be the ones doing the child, uh, not only the childcare, but the, the housework, the cooking and the cleaning, providing a nice, safe, stable environment, not only to bring up the children, but also to look after her husband, her partner, when he comes home from work and perhaps he may be stressed after a difficult day. So again, this is a very traditional conservative view. We may have different views today, but it's important to understand what Parsons and other sociologists have said in the past. So conservative thinkers such as the neoliberal new right would agree with this. They quite like the setup. They think it's very traditional. It's very um, it's fixed. It's sturdy. It has roots. It has foundations. Um, around the world, we see it replicated in a whole range of different societies. And because it is so, dare I say, normal or has been seen normal in the past, this is why it should continue. So they quite like that tradition. Parsons' ideas have, of course, been criticised. So we do find in contemporary modern society or postmodern society, women are now doing more paid work. So that really kind of upsets that traditional model and does raise questions about how useful or suitable that model is. Also, arguably, the old systems benefit men more than women. So in that situation where men are going out to work, earning the money, then coming home and finding their dinner made, the kids washed and cleaned and put to bed, and the house tidy, that's a nice setup if you are a man or a husband. But for wives, it may be somewhat of a uh, problematic setup. I mean, ultimately, you're doing this work for free. You're not being paid. Uh, it can be very boring, very repetitive. There may not be options to have free time. And the lack of sort of financial independence ultimately means that women are dependent upon their husbands and their husbands giving them money, which is problematic. And in particular, feminists would have issues with this. We now need to consider conjugal roles. And these are roles within marriage. And it's Elizabeth Bott that really uses specific language to help explain these. She distinguished between two types of conjugal roles or roles within marriage. And again, of course, we are still assuming heterosexuality here, although perhaps we could begin to, in more contemporary times, apply this to homosexual relationships or homosexual marriages as well. In terms of segregated conjugal roles, this is the traditional nuclear family. This is instrumental role versus expressive role, and they are very much segregated. They are separated. Men have their roles, women have their roles, and never should the twain meet. They never come together. They never share their roles. It's a very traditional setup. Whereas in joint conjugal roles, the opposite is true. What we're finding here is that couples are sharing tasks such as housework and childcare. So perhaps when dad comes home, he'll be doing a bit of the childcare, maybe washing the children or playing with them or helping them with their homework. Um, perhaps also doing a bit of the housework, maybe some of the cooking and cleaning, or perhaps he will work the garden or do any of the DIY, whatever. Ultimately, however, they're sharing these tasks slightly more equally between husband and wife. Uh, whilst also we find that the couple, the married couple, are spending their leisure time together. Now, this wasn't the case in that segregated conjugal role setup. Previously, men tended to spend their leisure time with their fellow colleagues at work. Perhaps after work, they go to the pub, have a few drinks, play some darts, play some pool, whatever. That's how they spent their leisure time. Whereas for wives, for women, generally their leisure time was spent well, this is assuming they had any leisure time, was spent with female kin. That is to say, with their members of their own family who are also female, possibly also maybe next door neighbours or people living in the locale uh, who are also probably female, also have their own children. So there's a kind of a correspondence with them there. So this is different in the joint conjugal role set up. Instead, husbands and wives are spending their leisure time together. They are perhaps going away with the kids over a weekend, going out, maybe visiting the cinema, maybe going for a nice meal, whatever. They're spending their leisure time together. Young and Wilmot were interested in this idea of joint conjugal roles and how over time things were changing and we were moving away, in Britain at least, from segregated conjugal roles to a more 
joint conjugal role set up. And they argued that this was leading to the rise of the symmetrical family. So when something is symmetrical, think back to in primary school when you may have done some work using mirrors and looking at shapes, it's when something is the same on both sides or is identical on both sides. And we need to think about that in terms of husband and wives sharing roles. Young and Wilmot had looked at working class families in the East End, in particular Bethnal Green, in the late 1950s and saw that things were changing. Yes, there was lots of tradition there with regards to who did what in the household, but slowly but surely things were starting to change. We started to see what we might refer to as a march of progress, that things were changing, things were progressing, and in particular the position of women was changing um, quite dramatically actually. And the family's place in society and the family's place in history was progressing, was moving forward, change was here, it was going to happen, and Young and Wilmot were very excited about this. They saw it in a very kind of positive light. They found that women were working more, that women were going out of the home, getting a job, maybe part-time originally, but possibly moving on to full-time. They were earning money and bringing that money home to help pay for bits and pieces around their house. Men were doing more around the house too, so they were getting involved with the housework, uh, and couples were becoming more privatised. So again, to reiterate, kind of similar to what Elizabeth Bott found, couples were spending more of their leisure time together. So husbands and wives were you know, doing things together. Rather than being separated, when it came to their free time, they were doing things together. Young and Wilmer argued that this was a result of, firstly, the changes in women's position. So this movement away from seeing women as property to, firstly, women gaining the vote, women gaining the right to have a divorce, women gaining more control over their uh, reproductive uh, capabilities. So the thing about the introduction of the contraceptive pill, for example. This is what's changing women's position in society. We also see a range of different pieces of legislation introduced, which mean that women now have more power in the workplace, that they can't be discriminated against, that they can't be prejudiced against. So that really changes the position of women. Also, the fact that families were becoming more geographically mobile, families were smaller, families were more likely to move around, say, the UK, to try and find a job. So that was a big change too. It was a movement away from super large extended families where husbands and wives and kids often lived with their parents, sometimes on both sides, simultaneously. We also see changes to technology, and in particular, in the home, pieces of technology such as the microwave, the vacuum cleaner, the television, the radio, the fridge freezer. This revolutionises the way the family works and operates, the way the, the home works and operates. And in particular, men or husbands became quite interested in doing bits and pieces around the home because of the introduction of these pieces of technology. So suddenly men didn't mind doing a bit of hoovering or perhaps using a lawn mower or perhaps doing some cooking with the microwave because it was short, quick, simple, and it involved a gadget. And we tend to find, at the very least in Western society, that men are often very interested in gadgets. There's something about their socialisation that leads them to be that way. Finally, higher standards of living in general. What we were finding was that um, from the 1950s onwards, post-war onwards in the UK, but in the, in the West broadly and arguably in the whole world over, standards of living were rising. There was more money. There, you know, economies were starting to do better. There was more money floating around. People had, for the first time, disposable income. And it meant that they could you know, go on holidays, they could do different things, and they could buy these labour-saving devices in the home. And it leads to the rise of a more symmetrical family. Men are doing more at home. Women are doing more paid work. Husband and wives are becoming more similar. They're becoming more symmetrical. The family is more symmetrical. Now, Anne Oakley is a very famous feminist sociologist, and she had some interesting ideas regarding housework. She criticised the March of Progress view held by Young and Wilmot. She argued that husbands interviewed in research that she did helped once a week, and that this hardly uh, was symmetrical in regards of husbands and wives sharing more work around the home. So if the husband, if men in the home are doing a bit around the home once a week, that's not really symmetrical. Uh, that still means that, to be honest, wives are doing most of the housework and childcare. She agreed that there was some evidence of increased involvement of husbands in housework, but there was still a long way to go. She also found that many of those interviewed felt they were good fathers. So again, she was interviewing men, interviewing husbands who 
felt that they were good fathers because they played with the children in evenings or at weekends. But this tends simply to free up time for wives to do more housework, which is kind of ironic. So what we've got here is you know, husbands at home who think, yeah, I'm getting involved. I'm doing my bit around the home because they, what, push the hoover around the front room once a week or they, I don't know, stick something in a microwave once a week. Again, that's not really symmetrical. That means that you know, 95% of the time, mum's doing most of the housework. And because dad was, you know, perhaps playing with the children a couple of times a week, maybe, I don't know, using a computer game, although in the 1970s, that probably wouldn't have been the case. I don't know, watching the television or playing a board game. Um, they felt that they were getting involved in the childcare or perhaps they would, of a weekend, take the children out to do an activity once every now and again. And this meant that husbands were walking away thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm a great dad. I'm really involved. I'm, you know, I'm a forward thinking new man. I'm involved in the housework. I live in a symmetrical family. Actually, Anne Oakley saying that's not really the case. To be honest, mum's still doing most of the work. Anne Oakley argued domestic labour is heavily sex typed. That is to say that men and women do very different jobs in the home. So men tend to do the DIY and the gardening, whilst women tend to do the cooking and the cleaning. And this is often because men quite enjoy working with power tools and working in the garden, which is often seen as kind of a, a solo activity that you do on your own and get really involved with. They quite like using the tools once again. And so they often see it almost as part of their domain, their gender domain. They think, well, these are my jobs. I'm going to do these, but cooking and cleaning, no, 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 that's not for me. So women are left to do the cooking and cleaning, which is arguably the more laborious and boring task around the home. So therefore, they may not enjoy those as much. When women continue to do more housework than men, and of the domestic labour men do, it tends to involve the more rewarding aspects of childcare. So women are doing more housework still. And when men do get involved, they like to only do the nice stuff. So working with children, taking the children out of the weekend, maybe going to the park to have an ice cream, going to uh, the cinema, uh, perhaps taking the kids to go play football on Saturday morning, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Ultimately, men are almost cream skimming the nice jobs of childcare and leaving kind of the, the less desirable stuff, the discipline, putting the children to bed, making them do their homework, making them have a shower, whatever. These are kind of the, the more arduous childcare tasks and husbands are often leaving those to their wives or so Anne Oakley found. Men tend to get half an hour more free time per day than women. So what we're finding here finally is that men are somehow, once all the children are put to bed and all the housework is done, are having an extra half an hour to put their feet up, read their favourite book, play a computer game, watch the telly, surf the internet, whatever. Whereas women are perhaps thinking, oh, I'll just do that final bit of cooking, cleaning, whatever. So they're not getting as much free time. So again, not quite symmetrical, instead still quite unequal. Since an Oakley study in the 1970s, it's now become the norm for women to work and bring in a second income. And the vast majority of marriage or cohabiting women work now versus the 1970s. So there has been a big change over the last 40 or so years. Whereas previously, you know, still most women stayed at home and maybe engaged in some part time work. Today, most women will work and, as we've seen, pick up more of their childcare still as well. Looking at some other sociologists, Manu Khan found that better paid, younger, more educated women do less housework per week. So it would appear that, again, that march of progress is carrying on, it's marching forward. And as women become more educated and as time progresses, they do less housework per week. And that would seem to imply that men are picking up their share of the work. Jonathan Gashuni similarly found that women in full-time jobs did less housework. The longer they had a full-time job, the more domestic labour their husbands did too. And couples whose parents had more equal relationships were more likely to have a more equal relationship themselves. So there's kind of something there about socialisation, that if a child is socialised in an environment where their parents are quite equal, quite symmetrical, they're going to grow up thinking, well, that's the norm. That's what I've got to do. This is how it's going to be. And so they will replicate that in their own relationships later on. Gashuni explains this in two ways. Firstly, a gradual change in society's values. So as society changes, our values have changed. And now we tend to believe that you know, women's position should be one of equality with men in society. And so therefore, 
that is replicated or seen in relationships in the home. And also changes in parental models. You know, gone are the days of the Victorian period or even Edwardian period where children were seen and not heard, where the husband was head of the household and society is very patriarchal. Instead, we live in a more equal, more symmetrical world where children are very much seen and heard and children actually are the heart of the family and parents will, you know, bend over backwards to make sure that children get everything they need. However, he agreed with Oakley that domestic labour continues to be sex tight. Next, Rosemary Crompton in 1997 argued that changes in the domestic division of labour were connected to economic fa factors. So as women earn more, so men do more work at home. But in our society, even to today, pay is not equal. And that actually women's pay is only three quarters of men's pay. So as long as there is unequal pay, Crompton's arguing here, there will be an unequal domestic division of labour. And if we therefore can achieve true parity or equality in terms of pay and paid work, then women hopefully will finally have absolute equality with men in terms of the work done at home. So men will step up to the plate more if we can solve this equal pay issue. The British Social Attitude Survey is a very useful survey done every year. You can find information about this online. It's always good to sort of keep an eye on this as you're working through sociology of the two-year course. They found that there's been a fall in the number of people who think it's a man's job to be the breadwinner and a woman's job to be homemaker. So again, this is fairly recent. We're seeing that those traditional conservative archetypes or prototypes or models of how the family should operate or work seem to be diminishing in power and influence. Next, we need to consider the dual burden. Quite an interesting concept. Many feminists argue, however, that there is little evidence for the new man. This idea of the new man, the new dad, the new partner, the new heterosexual man who gets actively involved in housework, childcare, and shares the paid, paid work, the earning, with their partners or wives. Instead, Clarion Smith found that today women carry a dual burden of paid work and housework. That actually, women are not only doing the housework as they've always done in the past, they're now also doing paid work, as we know, and as a result, they are undertaking or are carrying a dual burden. Morris found that even unemployed men avoid housework. So even when men were unemployed, you would have thought perhaps logically they would pick up the slack and do most of the housework. Actually, this often meant that they were suffering a small crisis of masculinity. They no longer knew what their position was in the family or in wider society. And so they almost rejected doing any housework for fear that it would almost be effeminate and would undermine their masculinity. Although it must be said that Ramos found that the complete opposite was actually the case, that if men weren't working or if women, or if women were undertaking more paid hours than men, they generally did more around the home. So it's kind of a controversial area. It's an essentially contested area. And there's lots of different, almost conflicting statistics uh, on this at this point in time. We also need to consider emotion work and what we might also think of as the triple shift. So emotion work is work related to handling one's own or others' emotions. So often we have to, we are confronted with our own emotions, our own th thoughts and feelings. And when we have to sort of step, take a step back and think about them and almost meditate on them, that's emotion work. But also at the same time, if you are helping someone with their own thoughts and feelings and emotions, you're engaging in emotional labor there, you're helping them. And in the home, what we tend to find is that actually it's mum, it's the wife, it's the female member of the family that uh, engages in most of the emotional labor, not only for herself, but for everyone else. It's mum is the person that the children go to when they're unhappy, when they've had a nightmare, um, when they need support, when they're worried, nervous, sad, upset, whatever. They go to mum for the most part for help and guidance. And actually also husbands or partners, uh, when they are struggling at work, when they're having a crisis of masculinity, when they're having a midlife crisis, when they're upset or sad about anything that's going on, in their life generally, they often turn to their wives for support. And so actually it's mum who is engaging in the emotion work at home. So if we add this all together, so first it was Hotschild's idea, but it's more can you apply it to family. Duncan and Martin found that women are actually undertaking the majority of emotional work. And so therefore they are doing a triple shift of paid work, housework and emotional labour. So women really are working very, very hard and doing the vast majority of labour in all of its forms in relation to the family. So there's lots of questions here about whether or not uh, couples are becoming more equal. As we've seen, sociologists question uh, a number of different things in this particular area. So is a symmetrical family a lasting trend? 
are we seeing the rise of the new man who's actively involved in domestic labor and this would be the march of progress view or are women having to carry the dual burden or the triple shift of paid work and housework childcare and emotion work which would be the more typical feminist view so you may want to pause for a moment and just sort of weigh up all of these different arguments and think about what your personal views are and it may lead to the creation of some questions you may want to drop those down you can bring those to lessons and we can discuss those in summary evidence suggests that some there's been some movement towards equality but not very much and much more needs to be done evidence is highly conflicted findings from different studies show paradoxical trends on one hand it would appear that dad's getting more involved on the other hand he's not on one hand it would appear that women are becoming liberated and emancipated but on the other hand it would appear that actually they're just doing more work at home so it's a very murky area it's very difficult to get a real understanding of what's going on but it would appear that there has been some change but there's still more to be done when it comes to responsibility for housework and childcare, equality still appears some way off. Now then, we've tended to focus so far on heterosexual couples or straight couples, so it's kind of useful perhaps to do a quick comparison now with lesbian couples or homosexual couples, and in particular to think about gender scripts. And you may want to think about for a moment what is a script and what therefore might be a gender script. You may have come across this before when we were looking at education. And consider these questions. How might a lesbian couple with children differ from a heterosexual couple with children when it comes to roles undertaken in the home? And why might there be differences? Just take a moment now, maybe jot down a few ideas. When we're talking about gender scripts, what we're talking about are expectations of men and women in relationships. So if you think about how a script works, it is a set of lines an actor is given. But in those lines, it will have all this information regarding what type of character they're going to play, how that character should behave, what they should do, where they should stand, and so on. And what we find is, is actually in society, we have gender scripts. And these are, again, the expectations of men and women in relationships, how they should behave, what they should do, how they should act towards each other. In straight couples, Dunn found that this division of labour that we've already talked about continues because of these deeply ingrained gender scripts. It's almost as if from a child we are socialised often unwittingly with these gender scripts and as we grow older and we enter into relationships, heterosexual relationships, this continues, that we basically play out these scripts, these expectations or these perceived expectations of us based on our gender. But Dunn also found that this does not seem to be the case with homosexual couples or for us in this example, lesbian couples. And Weeks argued that same-sex relationships offer more opportunities to negotiate roles. The question is why? Well, by the very nature of not having someone of the opposite sex in that relationship, that therefore means that that role that they would be playing no longer exists. So there's kind of a vacuum, a gap, for that role to be picked up or shared between the two members of the relationship who are of the same gender. So in this example, two females... So they would perhaps already be aware of traditional female gender scripts, but they no longer have to defer or behave in a certain way towards the other um, individual in the group who would have been male and their gender scripts because they're not there. Instead, they are looking to each other as another person who is female and going, right, OK, so who's going to do these jobs? Who's going to play those roles? Actually, shall we negotiate? Shall we discuss who's going to do these jobs? Shall we have it as a more fluid setup? Shall we um, see how things change over time and develop over time? So it's far more democratic, it's far more open, and generally, Dunn and Weeks found far more equal. Um, in terms of homosexual couples, the likelihood that something similar will occur, but maybe it will be different also because, by very virtue of it being two males, there's going to be some differences in terms of the absence or the vacuum left behind by the lack of a female gender script being played out. So it's a very interesting concept there. That's it. Thank you very much.